one of them had a little bit of sore throat one day, so stayed home, but nothing, nothing, nothing after good. that resolved, so he went back. Um, they're happy to be back. Um, so far, I think something like 60 cases in Alberta in schools, but only one in-school mm -hmm. transmission. But you know what, I, I don't have a much hope that they'll finish the year in school. I think the second wave coming, it's it's accelerating, but we'll see, you know, what, yeah. enjoy it while it lasts. Well, in Saudi Arabia, we, uh, we the, it's no schools, it's just from a distance so far. Yeah. All schools from a distance. Okay, and Janice, you said your plants are doing well? They are, but uh, alas, it's the end of September soon, and I'll have to start taking the garden apart. Mm. Okay. How much of your garden, Dennis, do you bring home back inside? Well, I guess I have things, a lot of things in pots. So those are the things that I bring in. The stuff that I plant in the beds, a lot less of that comes in. I mean, I only have whatever room I have in my double car garage. So whatever that fits in a few plants for elsewhere in the house and uh, I'm limited. So unfortunately every year there's some things that uh, have to perish. Hmm. Well, it's good, so good to see you really and good to have you with me. I'm so excited, I was so excited about that. I guess we can start, it's nine o'clock exact now. So, hmm. Let me see if we have enough participants. We do have 18 participants, so I guess we are going to start. Uh, I would like to welcome all the, all the attendees, and uh, I would like uh, to thank our speakers who gave us time out of their precious schedule uh, from Canada. Uh, uh, Dr. Shamrani, actually I owe him a lot because he um, uh, pushed me to have this webinar uh, on ophthalmopathology. And uh, when we decided the topic, the first uh, thing that jumped to my mind is to invite my mentors, my colleagues, my dear friends from Canada. Uh, they are going to present um, uh, interesting cases. and. Um, the, uh, the objectives of the whole webinar is to reinforce the principle of clinical pathological correlation, to present interesting cases with unusual findings and or takeaway messages, and to show the importance of ophthalmic pathology and its great implementation in the lives of ophthalmologists. So many ophthalmologists won't you know, like be able to manage patients without a good ophthalmic pathologist uh, next to, to them. Uh, the uh, biography of our speakers, Dr. Heathcote, uh, of course, is well known and he has a very long biography. I had to cut it a bit short. He graduated in 1971 with an honor degree uh, in biochemistry from St. John's College, University of Cambridge, and then had his medical degree in 1974, University College Hospital Medical School in London, England. He had two research fellowships. The prominent one was on developmental biology laboratory at Harvard Medical School. And then during his residency at uh, University of Western Ontario uh, in London, Ontario, Canada, he developed the interest in ophthalmic pathology. He became the chief of the pathology at St. Joseph's uh, Health Center in London, Ontario, following which uh, he was appointed as head of department of pathology at Dalhousie University and chief of pathology in 2004 and laboratory medicine um, for eight laboratories of the capital districts of health authority in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And then in 2017, he became the Senior Medical Director for the Program of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine in the same place. He published so many papers in ophthalmic um, uh, uh, head and neck uh, uh, pathology, as well as a special interest in uh, ocular adnexy pathology and developmental pathobiology of the eye. Uh, he has been the chair of the Canadian Ophthalmic Pathology Society for a long period from 1999 to 2014 and then the president of the British Association for Ophthalmic Pathology from 2016 to 19. Uh, he also was the section editor of General Ophthalmic Pathology of the Canadian Journal of Ophthalmology and the first editor-in-chief for the Canadian Journal of Pathology from 2009 to 2015. Following this, he continues his, um, he retired, but then he continues his academic work as a professor in the Department of Pathology at Dalhousie University. So I would like to welcome him and thank him very much for accepting the invitation. 
Uh, the, yeah, you're welcome. Second speaker is Dr. Martin. Uh, he's a molecular biologist and pathologist. He has completed a combined MD PhD program at the University of Toronto, after which he also trained in anatomical pathology at the University of British Columbia. Uh, then he finished a combined head and neck endocrine pathology fellowship in U, U of T. He's an assistant professor now at the University of Calgary and the consultant pathologist in head and neck ophthalmic and endocrine pathology at the Foothills Medical Center and Rocky View General Hospital in Calgary. His interests are mainly in molecular pathology of salivary and lacrimal gland tumors in addition to squamous cell carcinoma of head and neck. So thank you, Dr. Martin, again, for accepting the invitation. We're glad to have you. Uh, Janice Safnik is a dear friend. Uh, she's an associate professor of anatomic pathology who practices surgical and cytopathology at University of Manitoba Health Sciences Center in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. She trained at the University of Manitoba and received her MD in 1980, followed by the FRCPC in pathology in 1985. And she has been practicing the ophthalmic pathologist for almost 35 years. Uh, as you can see here, I'm saying dear friend because uh, this is my mentor, Dr. Valerie White. And this picture was taken in June 2015 during the COPS meeting, which is the Canadian ophthalmic pathology meeting that was held in Victoria, and this is the butchered garden. Uh, we had so much fun on that day, and we took so many uh, lovely pictures and, and photos, as you can see here, with very nice uh, flowers. So um, uh, this is another picture just to uh, finish my introduction before they start their case presentations. Uh, it's actually a group picture when Dr. Heathcote, um, he hosted the Eastern Ophthalmic Pathology uh, meeting, which is usually held in the USA. It's held every four years uh, in Canada. So that was in Halifax. Um, and uh, that's why the, the group here is a mixture of Canadian and uh, um, of, of family pathologists from USA as well. As you can see here, this is Dr. Heathcote, our speaker, Dr. Janice and Dr. Martin. So the three of them are here, in addition to a few prominent uh, speakers uh, like Dr. Ralph Eagle and Charles Eberhardt from USA, myself and my dear friend from Saudi, Dr. Azza Maktoub. So I think I'm gonna leave the floor now and we'll stop sharing the screen and allow Dr. our first speaker, Dr. Heathcote to go ahead with his uh, cases. Okay. Uh, so let's... While he's doing so, I just um, remember to tell uh, the, yeah. the attendees, attendees to put their questions in the question and answer uh, window. And then I will be uh, able to communicate this to the uh, panelists. <clears throat> well, good evening and thank you very much, Hind. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to the Saudi Ophthalmological Society today. Um, my two cases are basically both related to the pathology of the retinal pigment epithelium and the first deals with the subjects of tumors. So a 62 year old woman presented with a one year history of decreased vision in her right eye. And she was referred with a probable diagnosis of choroidal neovascular membrane. At that time, her visual acuity in the right eye was 20 over 400 compared with 20 over 30 in the left eye. Here is the clinical view, and you can see a very dark lesion in the macula area with some exudate more peripherally. It's a fairly circumscribed. Yeah, uh, I, we cannot. Not sure, you're not seeing it? Yes. So if you can just repeat the share screen. Okay, I will try. I'll have to shut this down. Um, okay, where is your screen again? Share screen.
Do you see that now? No, it worked well with our when we did the rehearsal. It worked when we practiced, yes. So let me um, go and see if I can. You see the area down where it shows how many participants do we have and then Yes, unfortunately, what, what is happening is my second um, uh, talk is coming, so I'll have to open them both up again, I think. Um, maybe one at a time would be uh, uh, better to do that. Okay. And now I'll come back to the share screen. And let's see if I can open up. Is anything coming up? No. No? No. Oh, yeah. Now, let me shut that down. Now, let, let me try once again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, now we can see it. Okay, good. I'm sorry about that. No, no problem. So uh, I'll, I'll move quickly over the start since I have said it. Um, a woman of 62 with decreased vision for one year and a dark pigmented lesion in the macular area with some surrounding exudate. On ultrasound, it was less than three millimeters in height and showed moderate internal reflectivity. Fluorescein angiogram uh, just showed some vessels, possibly feeder vessels, draining vessels over the uh, lesion, but generally it was hypofluorescent. The clinical impression was that they were dealing with a choroidal tumor, probably involving the outer retina, and it, it was vascular. The ophthalmologist uh, suggested a diagnosis of an RPE adenoma. Followed for three months, there was no growth, but exudation continued to expand and vision dropped to counting figures. The patient was seen in consultation with Dr. Bill Harbour in the United States, who agreed that this was probably an adenoma of the retinal pigment epithelium. It was recommended that a vitrectomy an extraction or at least biopsy of the subretinal tumor was undertaken and a mass was removed that was two millimeters in diameter and a millimeter thick. It was submitted to pathology and the pathologist, a general surgical pathologist diagnosed a melanoma. It was then referred to me for a second opinion. So I saw a pigmented tumor, melanin scattered throughout, with a vague fascicular pattern. At higher power, it wasn't particularly hypercellular, and many of the cells appeared to have vacuolated cytoplasm, others with melanin present. There was some variation in size and shape, but no significant atypia and no mitotic activity. A few small blood vessels scattered throughout. The real clue to the diagnosis was when I used the periodic acid shift stain, which revealed a fair degree of matrix outlining the cells and small groups of cells, consistent with basement membrane material, suggesting that it was not melanocytic, but it was epithelial. This lesion underlie, underla, underlay the uh, degenerate 
retina, and there was no apparent barrier between the two. Immunohistochemistry showed that the cells expressed cytokeratins, confirming their epithelial nature. A vimentin, but not a marker for melanocytic lesions. And so my diagnosis was adenoma of the retinal pigment epithelium. Four months after surgery, the retina was flat in the macular region. There was some residual pigmentation, but vision in that eye had increased from counting figures to 20 over 100, which I think everybody would agree is a rather good result. And this is the view. You can see the scarring with residual pigmentation. The exudate is starting to resolve a little. If we look at the topic of retinal pigment epithelial proliferation, there are a variety of types. There are hamartomas of the retinal pigment epithelium. You can get diffuse pro proliferation as a re reactive change over a choroidal tumor. And there are a number of nodular proliferations, prominent reactive hyperplasia, one could think of ringe fila that form at the aura serrata after long-standing retinal detachment, and then neoplasms, adenomas, and adenocarcinomas, which are much rarer. So hyperplasia is more common than neoplasia, and is usually associated with pathological changes in the eye, be it trauma or inflammation. The cells usually have a characteristic tubulo lamella pattern of growth. And again, that key finding of the PAS positive stroma. The hyperplastic process can actually involve the retina and the choroid. Neoplasms tend to occur in the second half of life and are more common in women. They're usually unilateral and solitary, but can occur in all quadrants of the fundus, and the effect on the visual acuity is quite variable. The pressure is usually normal, and adenomas are much more common than adenocarcinomas. They're usually circumscribed lesions with an abrupt elevation. They're not mushroom-shaped. They're very rarely amelanotic. And they're often surrounded by yellowish exudate, be that in the retina or under the retina. Fluorescein, we noted the hypofluorescence. There's often leakage from overlying retinal vessels. And feeding and draining vessels may be quite prominent. Ultrasound, as we saw, dome-shaped lesion with moderate to high internal reflectivity. The pathology, these variably pigmented epithelial cells in a variety of pattern, they may be solid sheets, they may form tubular structures, they may even form papillae. Clear cytoplasmic vacuoles are there, and one can see local invasion into the retina, the vitreous, the uvea. Again, that PAS positive stroma is a very important clue. Nuclear variation is mild. Finger produced the largest series of adenocarcinoma uh, cases, 12 documented cases with invasion into the choroid or extrascleral extension. Only four of the 12 had metastases, and all of those cases dated from before 1940. So it, it's certainly um, sus likely that those diagnoses are really suspect. There is only, I think, one well-attested case of metastatic adenocarcinoma of the RPE, and those were intracranial metastases reported by Heindel in 2008. And interestingly, that patient had trisomy 21. Malignancy in these tumors is diagnosed based on mitotic activity, necrosis, infiltration of the choroid or optic nerve, and particularly growth around emissary vessels into the 
that periocular space. Shields reviewed the treatment in 1999. These tumors are not particularly radiosensitive. So local resection, if it's possible, uh, is recommended. If it's a posterior lesion, then laser photocoagulation or cryotherapy may work. And if it's a large lesion, or if there's a suspicion that it is malignant, then enucleation would be the treatment. I'm happy if there are any questions. Thank you, Dr. Heathcote. Um, do you want to go ahead with your second case, if it's easier for you, and then Martin will be the third? Or uh, uh, yes, I'll. Uh, well, I'll certainly try and hope I get a better start than I did last time. Um, and meanwhile, for the attendees, please post your questions in the question and answer. And then um, what I have planned is to have two sessions because we have two cases from each speaker, so a total of six cases. So we're going to have three cases and then we'll open up the questions for a few minutes and then we'll start the second session after. Is that coming up on the screen? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, so I'm having the same problem. Um, Do you want Martin to go ahead with his case meanwhile? Uh, well, since I'm starting, maybe I should just carry on. You will carry on, okay. Martin, a, a, a clear, clear run. Um, and then I will go to uh, this. Let's see. Is that showing? Not yet. Not yet. Oh dear. Um, let me go back and see if I can. Share screen. And... Oh. Is nothing showing up? No. Well, maybe Martin should go ahead and I'll, I'll respect right. the computer. Maybe you better close your first case completely and then have only your second case. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Martin, can you go ahead, please? Good evening to all attendees. Um, thank you very much to Dr. Alcatan for um, inviting me to be part of this uh, group of presenters. I hope my two cases um, will illustrate uh, some interesting issues in ophthalmic pathology and ophthalmology. And my first one I've uh, decided to name when the eye reflects the skin, ugly cells and bad elements. And I hope at the end of the talk, you will uh, appreciate why I gave it that title. So like any good story or bad story, uh, this started with a phone call. Um, I was called towards the end of December, just before our Christmas time. Um, there is incoming vitreous biopsy, which is a, a um, quality assurance uh, method we've instituted in my previous uh, position um, to make sure that vitreous biopsy specimens are properly uh, triaged and um, processed, because it wasn't always the case prior to that. There, there are special um uh, specimens that need to be um, processed in a special in a, in a certain ways. So I looked up the case of the patient that I knew was uh, having this procedure. Um, the biopsy indication was that she had a hazy vitreous. She was a 69 year old retired widow with four children. She had some remote smoking history, um, a variety of um, medical problems that didn't think to um, be related to her eye problems at the time anyway. Um, she had some surgical history for fibroids and tonsillectomies and appendectomies. 
um, and some um, medications, including uh, pain medications for her sciatica. In terms of her ocular history, um, there was a history of sequential bilateral non-anteritic um, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, first involved was left eye, um, sorry, right eye first, and she's had uh, quite significantly reduced vision from that. And then a year after that, a left eye got involved and was had some presentation, but her vision remained good. Um, I did get the notes from her examination and uh, it showed that uh, her corrected right eye vision was 20 over 40, the left one was 20 over 50 at the time of the biopsy. There was a right relative afferent pupillary de defect. Ocular motility was normal bilaterally. Uh, the pressures were within normal range and there was bilateral nuclear sclerotic cataracts consisting with her age. Um, and significant finding was the um, hazy vitreous, um, much more pronounced on the left than the right. Now, I don't see patients, so I don't have images of this, um, but I found one on the internet that I'll show in a second. So the diagnosis clinically was bilateral vitritis of some sort, uh, left, predominantly left. Um, and the worry was that there might be ocular involvement by lymphoma or other causes, such as infections, obviously. Um, so a vitreous biopsy and washout were scheduled for 18th of December. So again, uh, we're trying to organize it so we could finish this, uh, signing out this case before um, the break for the Christmas time. And so this was the cytology from that vitreous biopsy. This is a pap smear, which was one of the stains that is done routinely on these specimens. And first thing to notice for a biopsy, a vitreous biopsy, this is a very cellular specimen. This is as cellular as they get. Um, interestingly, even in that field, you can see one mitosis. There is a variety of quite pleomorphic uh, cells. So this is a highly suspicious of some sort of malignancy. Um, there are more mitoses seen in other fields, which is again, something we don't see very often given how few cells we typically see. Um, Gimza is a different stain we do. This allows us to look at the nuclear uh, morphology and, uh, and uh, it showed a variety of very concerning large cells with a lot of um, nuclear atypia. Here is a closer look. Um, just looking at this, lymphoma has to be high on your differential diagnosis. Um, we did have cell block, and that cell block actually had cells to work with. That's key for doing immunohistochemistry, which in this case um, would allow us to try to subtype this um, uh, much more. And so uh, lymphoma type uh, immunohistochemistry was ordered, and it showed that the cells were positive for CD3, which is a marker of uh, T lymphocytes. CD20, marker of B cells, was negative. CD4 was uh, focally present in some cells, it wasn't overwhelming. So that would be CD4 T cell lymphocyte type. CD8, I'm not showing, was negative. But certain markers of cytotoxic T cells and NK T cells, such as TIA1, were strongly positive, as was CD56 and Granzan B. The key 67 which is a proliferative marker, uh, essentially is, is positive in any cell that under, undergoes uh, uh, cell division. Uh, it was positive in, an entire, in most of the cells. So that shows a highly proliferative malignancy. Now, what I didn't tell you that this lady did have a bit of oncologic history. I hid it under uh, chronic skin issues. So this lady um, noticed eight years prior to this presentation, um, a pruritic rash. Um, it was affecting multiple skin areas. Uh, um, they came out about the same time. This was treated by the dermatologist and her family doctor with various topical therapies without any effect. And finally, she underwent a biopsy. Um, this is a biopsy from an eyebrow, which was one of her affected areas. And what we see here is skin. It's not a normal skin. There is um, maturation defect here showing up as, as parakeratosis. 
Um, and what you can see is that the adnexal structures, especially the hair follicles, are infiltrated with something. There are too large, there's too many cells here. There's also solar elastosis of a sun exposed skin. Here's one of those hair follicles. And what you can see um, is that it, the normal structure is, is altered and there is some um, clear material present as well as uh, lymphoid cells surrounding it. It's very hard to appreciate actually that this is a budded outline of the hair follicle, which is edematous. There are some giant cells present as well. And in the overlying epidermis, there is nests of atypical looking cells, as well as more atypical looking cells infiltrating the skin. Here's one such nest. We call them potier mic microabscesses. Her cutaneous history uh, progressed over the next five years. She had several more biopsies. And finally, on the biopsy in 2016, which is two years before her ocular presentation, she was diagnosed finally with mycosis fungoides. Um, this is not atypical. Uh, patients with this disorder um, often have multiple skin biopsies before the diagnosis is made. It's very hard to make this diagnosis on, on a single biopsy. Now in 2016 at the time, um, she was in a patch only stage. She didn't have any plaque or tumors. So that's a stage 1B at, um, at least in this staging system at the time. And it involved about 20% of her skin surface. Uh, she was treated with the standard treatments at the time, which was UVB light therapy and soriotane. And unfortunately, she had no response. She was putting up, put on some biologicals um, and then progressed to plaque and tumor stage despite all that. So finally, in 2017, uh, she was rebiopsied. And unfortunately, at this time, the biopsy showed not just amycosis fungoides, but also presence mm -hmm. of a large cell that were still CD3 and 4 positive, but now CD5 negative, granzyme positive. And because they were medium to large cells, she was now diagnosed with high grade transformation to large T cell lymphoma, which is a known complication of mycosis fungoides. So a big gun approach was taken, and she received total skin, uh, skin electron beam radiation. Um, now this worked. This actually cured her of her cutaneous disease and all the, her uh, cutaneous rashes um, have resolved. Um, and then for the next year, she was uh, essentially asymptomatic until she presented with that left, decreasing left vision in the eye, which led to ophthalmology consult, which left to the vitreous biopsy. So my bio, uh, diagnosis in this particular case was uh, that of largely typical lymphocytes present and this I thought was consistent with ocular involvement by the large T cell lymphoma, likely um, the one that transformed from her mycosis fungoides. And I did make a comment that the immunohistochemistry, while not typical for myc mycosis fungoides, was consistent with that seen in that biopsy of the, from the hip where the large cell transformation is not. So let's talk a little bit about this disease, which may not come on ophthalmologist uh, radar too often. It's a fairly common cutaneous lymphoma. In some studies, this is the most common type of cutaneous lymphoma. Unfortunately, it's un incurable, but in most cases, the disease is indolent and people live with the disease for many years. Um, effective treatments do exist. Those treatments she underwent uh, work in a lot of times, in a lot of cases. Uh, it, they didn't work for her, unfortunately. Uh, the typical phenotype of the um, neoplastic cell in the skin causing the disease is a helper T cell. So it's a CD3 positive, CD4 positive T lymphocyte. Now, as I said, most of the cases are indolent. However, aggressive variants of forms of mycosis fungoides do exist. And the risk factors for having an aggressive form of the disease are advanced age, that means over 60 increasing involvement of skin surface, the more skin surface involved, the higher the, the chance of aggressive force taking place. Progression to tumor stage, nodal metastasis, spread to extracutaneous sites, especially visceral involvement, leukemic involvement, which is known as Cesare syndrome, where blood is involved, transformation to high-grade T cell lymphoma, and certain histomorphologic variants such as follicular tropic and this is the variant I showed you in the cutaneous biopsy from her eyebrow. 
was both follicular tropic mycosis fungoides. When the disease does spread outside skin, it tends to involve liver, spleen, and lungs most commonly. And I mentioned Cezzy's syndrome. So this is when mycosis fungoides involves blood and you can detect per circulating per peripheral blood um, um, uh, T cells, uh, known as Cezzy cells. It can also present with erythrodermal lymphadenopathy. Now, large cell transformation, as we've seen in this slide, occurs in about 10% of cases, but in advanced stages of disease, this is much more common, 20 to 50% of cases. And in those cases, five-year survivor is low, below 20%. Death typically uh, occurs from in overwhelming infections or visceral involvement of key organs. How about ocular involvement in mycosis fungoides? It's reported to be present in 2% of patients. However, there is a variety of ocular presentations and the most common is the periocular skin, skin of eyelid, um, and that's what's seen most frequently. Conjunctival, coruncle, coruncle uh, and corneal involvement can happen. It's much more rare. Direct ocular um, adnexal involvement can be seen. And finally, intraocular involvement is the rarest form of this uh, disease in the eye. And this can happen either directly from invasion from skin into the eye or through systemic spread. CNS and intraocular involvement are very rare. Um, several possible forms are uh, have been described when this happens. Isolated vitritis, panuveitis, corneal retinal tumors, and isolated optic nerve involvement are some of the presentations that have been observed. Treatments include systemic chemotherapy and radiation. And here's an interesting report from three years ago where um, uh, CNS manifestations of, of mycosis fungoides were being listed but ocular changes have been included in that table. And you can see that 22 out of 77 patients had some sort of ocular changes. That's 30% of patients. However, a lot of them were um, um, symptomatic um, through their CNS um, involvement. Now, one word about the changing in phenotype. Uh, when the large cell transformation occurs, um, the mycosis fungoides cells can acquire a variety of atypical um, uh, expression of markers. And one of them is loss of CD4 expression, acquisition of CD56, and acquisition of CD30. Increase in CD8 expression can also occur, as well as cytotoxic cell markers, which we saw in our case. So to finish the case, um, while we were working at this up, patient ad was admitted to ER, she fell. Um, family was reporting increasing withdrawal and confusion. Urgent imaging was ordered once we released our report and um, she was uh, shown to have a large um, anterior um, brain mass tumor. This was not biopsy, it was just assumed from our report that this was the mycosis fungoides involving the brain. Um, unfortunately, patient passed away four months after that biopsy. So to conclude my talk, Mycosis phygoides can have aggressive course. This occurs in about 15% of cases. Ocular involvement is fortunately rare and usually limited to periocular skin, eyelid, conjunctiva, and cornea, but intraocular involvement can occur. When that does happen, it predicts brain metastasis and urging imaging to detect those needs to be ordered. Those are my references, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Martin. That was really a nice case. Unfortunate for the patient, of course. Uh, again, um, we'll go back to um, Dr. Heathcote once Martin yeah, stops sharing the screen. Um, and I remind the attendees again to post any questions in the question and answer uh, window. Is that coming up now? Yes, you can go ahead, Dr. Heathcote. Okay. So you can see that? Yep, very clear. All right, thank you. Um, 
So my second RPE case is the entity of pseudoretinitis pigmentosa, <clears throat> which is one of the retinal changes after trauma. So the index case here is a 75-year-old man who at the age of three had um, a penetrating injury in his right eye, which ultimately became physical. His other eye was normal. Uh, so the right eye was enucleated and it showed a variety of changes consistent with his history of trauma, diffusely opaque cornea with irregular scarring, a summerings ring cataract, and some patchy pigmentary change, particularly in the peripapillary region. And these are views of the fundus of the surgical specimen. And you can probably, this is the cornea here and here. So you can probably see at the posterior pole, there is patchy pigmentation, a suggestion of linearity to some of these patches. On microscopic examination, you can see the summerings ring cataract, the anterior chamber, the anterior segment is damaged. And if we look more closely, there's an iris stromal cyst, there's some fibrous panis beneath the epithelium. There's calcific band keratopathy and spheroidal droplet degeneration with a mild degree of angle recession on one uh, side and the angle uh, damaged almost beyond recognition on the other with the iris leaflet plugging um, the area of the trabecular meshwork. The optic nerve head shows some cupping. You can follow the line of the lamina cribrosa, and there are some optic nerve head drusen present. But the interesting thing is the retina, which was adherent to the choroid, and there was barely residual retinal pigment epithelium. Much of the retinal pigment epithelial cells had translocated into the neurosensory retina, and it started to cluster around blood vessels where there was a deposit of basement membrane material. Here's another view, an irregular RPE, areas of loss, areas of proliferation, and then more RPE cells clustered in the inner retina. The term pseudoretinitis pigmentosa was suggested by David Cogan in 1950 because he felt these changes in the retina mimicked the changes seen in genuine cases of retinitis pigmentosa, such as this one, a man of 65. Um, here's his inner retina, and you can see basement membrane material with a cluster of RPE cells around it, the same here and disruption, indeed loss, of RPE and chorioretinal adhesion. Some years later, he reported 32 cases, established the criteria for this entity, and noted that it was present in 4% of enucleations after trauma. So in retinitis pigmentosa, here is our 65-year-old man, he's mental uh, mentally retarded and has been blind in both eyes since he was a child. And the pigment has this unusual form of little linear deposits, which have been referred to as bone spicules. But this is completely a misnomer because what this resembles is actually the haversion system of compact bone. Here is a longitudinal section through cortical bone, here is a transverse section. And you can see these little linear areas, but they're not spicules of bone. They're actually the spaces in which the bone cells live. However, bone spicule pigmentation is uh, a well-established term, and I don't think we're going to change it now. So, Kogan's criteria were 
Firstly, you have to exclude true retinal uh, retinitis pigmentosa. The basic architecture of the retina must be identifiable, but the rods, cones, and outer nuclear layer should be missing from most of the retina. And within the retina itself, clusters of RPE cells are seen around excessive basement membrane deposits. And that is what we saw in this case. Among the, the causes that Cogan identified, perforating injury without often direct trauma to the, the retina, it could be idiopathic or other causes such as high myopia or a dislocated lens. Some years later, <clears throat> Heck and Lively produced a comprehensive view, review of the topic and provided a, a working definition. Disorders that have a pigmentary retinopathy or mimic retinitis pigmentosa, but are not called retinitis pigmentosa because another diagnosis is present. And he categorized them into three groups. An idiopathic group, which included birdshot um, atrophy, although that is in fact a rare cause of um, pseudoretinitis pigmentosa. Acquired infections such as syphilis and rubella, drug toxicity and the trauma. And then hereditary forms, particularly some of the advanced vitreoretinal degenerations. Here's another case of pseudoretinitis pigmentosa, a young woman with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis who had a variety of ocular complications, chronic uveitis, secondary glaucoma, a retinal tear with focal laser therapy and uh, cataract extraction and pseudophagia. Again, we see in the retina loss of the outer nuclear layer and the photoreceptor layers and clustering of the RPE cells around basement membrane material in the inner neurosensory retina. And the PAS stain highlights that this is consistent with a uh, basement membrane material. A slightly higher power. Here you can see a patent blood vessel with red cells in it, the basement membrane deposit around it, and the clustered RPE cells. And there's another one here. That vessel looks actually as though it's occluded. And if we look at the RPE, areas of loss and areas perhaps of hypertrophy or hyperplasia. Hogan uh, pointed out uh, that pseudoretinitis pigmentosa could actually occur in a rather restricted form in areas of the retina overlying a choroidal melanoma. Here is a, a, an amelanotic melanoma situated at the equator of the globe. Here's the cornea. And if you look closely at the overlying retina posteriorly, you can see that there is bone specular pigmentation. And here is the microscopic picture of that. This is actually inverted. The toroid is here. Uh, the inner retina is here. But again, you can see the uh, pigmented cells clustered around blood vessels. As Kogan pointed out, it is nowhere near as well developed as in retinitis pigmentosa itself or in other causes of pseudoretinitis pigmentosa. How does pseudoretinitis pigmentosa occur? Well, the one thing everybody agrees on is that there is early damage to the outer nuclear layer and retinal pigment epithelium. What happens next is not so clear. It could be spasm of the choroidal circulation with necrosis. It's been suggested that the RPE cells transform to phagocytes. We know that they're capable of doing this and just digest the photoreceptors. Or the RPE cells become disrupted 
as a result of the trauma, and they release a whole range of hydrolytic enzymes, which proceed to damage uh, the um, uh, junction between the retina and the choroid. There is some experimental evidence to support that last mechanism. Um, we know that an early injury may resolve without pseudoretinitis pigmentosa. What stimulates the proliferation and migration of the RPE cells? With Professor Lee in Glasgow suggested that it was actually the loss of the inner and outer segments. Lee also, while discussing the topic, pointed out that in age-related macular degeneration, you can actually find an area of pseudoretinitis pigmentosa at the periphery of the discoform lesion. I think we're all familiar with the fact that discoform scars can in fact be so heavily pigmented that they mimic melanomas. So in the case of our post-traumatic uh, pseudoretinitis pigmentosa, the pathological diagnosis was of the penetrating injury with um, an iris stromal cyst, changes to the angle producing secondary glaucoma and optic atrophy, our pseudoretinitis pigmentosa, and optic nerve head trusen. And here's a rather imperfect picture of David Cogan, uh, who um, gave us so much to, to think about in ophthalmology and in ophthalmic uh, pathology. He was a mentor to uh, many of us. I was very fortunate in my early career to get to know him and have his uh, support. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heathcote. Thanks, thank you very much. Uh, now we um, finished the first session with three case presentations. Uh, I would encourage uh, the attendees uh, to put their questions, post their questions if there's any. Um, meanwhile, I do have a question for Dr. Heathcote regarding the RPE um, adenoma. Uh, we came across a, a blind eye uh, and after nucleation, uh, a tumor was discovered. It was fitting into an, an adenocarcinoma, actually. But the morphology of the intraocular structures was not clear uh, whether it's arising from an RPE or a ciliary body epithelium. So are there any clues histopathologically or by immunohistochemistry that will make us differentiate the two um, or at least tell us about the possible origin? Well, I don't think there's an, uh, there's an absolute way of distinguishing them. <clears throat> Location obviously helps in some cases, but the ciliary epithelium can certainly produce um, uh, adenomas and adenocarcinomas. Um, so I think think uh, location would probably be the most uh, helpful uh, clue. But if the eye itself is disorganized, that might not be so easy to uh, determine. And if it's a, ma a malignant neoplasm, it, it has presumably expanded um, substantially from its original site of origin. Yeah, some path uh, pathologists claim that you will have a specific basement membrane-like appearance. And you did mention this in the histopathology of your case that might indicate, you know, or favor the RPE uh, origin rather than the ciliary body. Uh, yes, uh, but um, again, the uh, tumors of the, the ciliary epithelium also secrete basement yeah. membrane material. One only has to think of the Fuchs adenoma or the coronal adenoma, which is has a large component of basement membrane in. So I'm not sure that it can be used as a distinguishing feature between a ciliary origin and an, and, uh, an RPE uh, origin. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I don't see any posted questions. Um, I don't know if Martin or Janice have any, uh, any comments on the previous discussion or the previous cases. Anyone? I received one question in the chat uh, regarding my talk, and that is, does the name mycosis fungoides have anything to do with fungal infections, um, as it might seem uh, the name? Um, I, I have to say that I don't know for sure. I've always just assumed that the patch stage of mycosis fungoides can mimic cutaneous uh, fungal infections and therefore um, you know, be treated as such and then they don't respond and so on. But I'll refer actually um, this question to Dr. Heathcott because I know he knows much more than I do on this. Godfrey, would you have an answer to this question? Well, I do. Um, it actually refers to the tumor stage. Ah, all right. Uh, this cutaneous T cell lymphoma, because often at the tumor stage, the the actual the tumor is so aggressive that the tumors literally appear overnight. They're growing very, very rapidly. And often what happens, if you, if you imagine a dome-shaped nodule, the central portion undergoes necrosis and probably liquefaction to some extent. And you are left with what looks like a volcano with a crater which the, the early pathologists and surgeons felt resembled the upturned cap of a mushroom. Um, I have a paper in the CJO, I think, in, I think it was 1993, which I think actually shows uh, one of these lesions on the hand of a woman who had periocular and intraocular mycosis fungoides. I will, um, with your permission, have to incorporate that image into my uh, talk. Yeah. Yes, sure. You're welcome. Okay, uh, so I guess we can move to the second session. We do have three uh, case presentations, one by Martin and two by Dr. Janice. Um, would you like to continue, Martin, uh, with your second case, or would you rather have uh, Janice presenting hers first? Dr. Safnik has been waiting patiently. I think let's let, let her present one of the talks. And if I go over time, at least she won't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can do that. Sure. I can go ahead, Dr. Janice Safnik, please. Okay. There, can you see my screen? You can see my screen and you can hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So the first of my cases is that of an infected scleral buckle by one very unusual organism, Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, as well as Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I have nothing to declare financially. And um, this uh, scleral buckling treatment has been around for many years and has been a standard for treatment. There are complications though, and one of these complications is infection. And the infection may arise from the buckle being extruded and being open to the environment. The kinds of infections that develop have been classified into scleral abscesses, external infections, and endophthalmitis, which is the rarest of those three complications. The incidence of infections varies in various studies, but has been decreasing over time. So uh, procedures in the past would be said to have a 0.5 to 5.6% of infections and scleral buckling, more recent studies suggest that this is probably less than 1%. The vast majority of the infections are bacterial in nature and typically due to Staphylococcus species. But of the gram-negative bacteria, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in some studies has been the most common, making up about 7%. But there have been in the literature only three reported cases of stenotrophomonas maltophilia infections, and I'm about to add another. 
So the patient was an 85 year old woman who lived in a nursing home. She was noted to have bilateral tearing, ocular discharge and blurred vision. On examination, she had visual acuity was much better in the left and she was noted to have chronic right dacryocystitis. On examination, she had bilateral complete nasolacrimal duct obstruction and an inferior retinal detachment in her right eye. So later bilateral dacryocystorhinostomies were performed and the cultures from that grew a variety of different organisms, but you'll notice conspicuously absent from this list is stenotrophomonas and pseudomonas. In June 5th, it was decided to insert a silicone scleral buckle to try and improve her retinal detachment. Uh, but unfortunately, she developed an infection in her right eye despite patency of the lacrimal duct systems. On July 3rd, she was noted to have conjunctival and scleral necrosis. But interestingly, the buckle was not exposed. The next day, she underwent a nucleation. The buckle was cultured and grew Pseudomonas aeruginosus and Stenotrophomonas maltophilia. Following removal of the eye and the buckle, the infection cleared up. And here is the eye. And while you can see that clearly there is something wrong as we gaze through the slightly cloudy vascularized cornea, I think the most striking thing here is the roughness of the sclera with an area that appears to be ulcerated. Here from side aspects, you can see the sclera everywhere practically appeared to be in very poor shape with associated hemorrhage. And on opening the eye, this impression was confirmed. You can see that the sclera here is expanded and looks like it's at least partially destroyed. Only in some of the spots more posteriorly do we see sclera that looks as though it, it may be intact and unaffected. And as well, we can note that the lens is pushed forward. We've got a retinal detachment and abundant subretinal hemorrhage. Here is a pupil optic nerve H and E stain section. And that area that looked like an ulcer on gross examination was indeed one. The sclera here has completely been dissolved. You can see the tremendous amount of inflammation that's present here, even at this very low power. And sclera that seems to be at least partially necrotic if it's there at all, and an expanded looking choroid. Again, the uh, detached retina and the hemorrhage and much of the internal contents of the eye was not inflamed but certainly the areas next to the sclera were. Here you can see the cornea we can recognize here decimase membrane and there is an abscess that is just anterior to it and tremendous inflammation within the sclera. You can see this inflammation has extended uh, into the iris and there appears to be abundant necrotic debris anterior to it. Here again, you can see the inflammation extending into the ciliary body. The uh, sclera has been totally dissolved by this inflammation here and here. Most of the inflammation that was present was acute in nature. I didn't see any kind of granulomas. Nonetheless, I stained it not only for bacteria with gram stain, but also for methenamine silver for fungi and with ZN looking for mycobacteria. And I could not find any organisms. But you can see the extent to which this inflammation is chewing up the sclera, really dissolving it. And no wonder that it looked so bad as it did on gross examination. There was also an abscess in one area within the sclera. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Stenotrophomonas maltophilia are both gram-negative opportunistic pathogens. Stenotrophomonas maltophilia was originally described and thought to be a kind of pseudomonas. They have a lot of similar characteristics, but by the time they did some RNA analysis, in 1993, it was decided to call this organism in its own genus 
And so we have stenotrophomonas of which maltophilia is the only organism in that particular genus. Originally, it was found in uh, various cultures, but this was thought to be a contaminant, but now they recognize that it does cause a range of infections in humans and eyes are one of the places where we can find it. Well, how does this organism end up uh, arriving in our bodies? Well, it's found ubiquitously. It's out in the environment. It's especially found in moist areas. It's distributed worldwide. And many of the infections that have been attributed to it are acquired in hospital, although there are increasing numbers of community acquired infection. This organism, Stenotrophomonas, loves to colonize plastics, tubing, uh, machines, anything of that nature. And so, of course, when you're in a hospital, you have contact with many of these items and you increase your risk. And although some cases occur in people who are totally healthy, a lot of patients have pre-existing conditions that result in them being immunosuppressed to some degree. Stenotrophomonas maltophilia is a low-grade pathogen, but despite this, it has numerous virulence factors. It has a low membrane permeability. It's got multi-drug resistance genes. It's got plasmids that harbor antibiotic resistant genes. And there are various gene transfer mechanisms that it uses to acquire new antimicrobial resistance, which is a problem for treating this organism. And as you can see from this diagram, it has both extracellular and cell associated resistance factors. It secretes a number of different enzymes that help to break down tissues and allow it to uh, thrive. Uh, and as well, it often is found in, in uh, a relationship with another organism, some other kind of organism with which it can share uh, genetic material and acquire increased resistance. It is also specially known for forming biofilms and these biofilms, the organisms are protected in that environment. And, and so again, it makes it tougher for antibiotics to penetrate. And all of this is controlled by what's known as a quorum sensing regulatory system, a quite a sophisticated uh, system for a bacterium. And this allows it to, um, to take and, and confront other organisms, bacteria or fungi, and uh, repel them. So to help itself establish more securely. Ocular infections associated with stenotrophomonas maltophilia are primarily involving the anterior segment, conjunctivitis, keratitis in patients who have worn contact lenses, for example, dacryocystitis, uh, but also has been noted in occasional cases of endophthalmitis. These in particular have occurred post-surgery, such as post-cataract surgery, post-trauma, or a few cases of which are endogenous. Uh, some patients, for example, those with cystic fibrosis may have their lungs colonized by this organism and the organism can spread endogenously to other sites. And as I mentioned, there have been three previously reported cases of sclerobuccal infections with this organism. There also have been clusters of infections linked with endophthalmitis, typically with cataract surgery, with intraocular intravitreal injections, uh, or even with a contaminated balanced salt solution. And while it was really a rare organism to find in the 1970s, looking at cultures of ocular specimens, more recently it has appeared more frequently. So this may be an organism that we start to see more of. Of course, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is well known to cause a variety of ocular infections, somewhat similar spectrum to Pseudomonas, uh, so to, um, sorry, Stenotrophomonas multifilia. And here is an eye from a Pseudomonas infection, and you can see this was a corneal ulcer. And uh, as in the eye I've presented, there's been necrosis of the sclera as well as the cornea. So a review of the literature since I originally presented this, which was back around 2004, has disclosed only one more case of stenotrophomonas maltophilia associated with sclerobuckles. There have been more cases than eight of pseudomonas, but I use these eight as a comparison uh, to see how the organism infection differs between the two. 
So pseudomonas may have an acute or a chronic onset. Of the cases where the information was available for stenotrophomonas, the onset was more of a, an acute nature, but occurring after about three to four weeks. It likes to be part, as I mentioned, of a polymicrobial infection. And in all previously reported cases, the buckle had been exposed. Our case differs in that our buckle was not exposed and the breakdown that was seen was immediately prior to nucleation and presumably was due to the organisms um, rather than being the cause of the infection itself. So for our case, it's possible that the organism was part of the dacryocystitis and the cultures just didn't pick up the organism, although that seemed unlikely. The patient lived in a nursing home and she rubbed her eyes a lot. So the external environment there would be suitable for having these organisms around. It's possible that her eye drops were contaminated or that the scleral buckle was in some way contaminated, although we had no other infections with this organism and that some equipment could have been contaminated. But again, this was just an isolated incident. This wasn't part of a series of cases. And it's also possible that since she had the conjunctival necrosis that uh, there was more damage there initially than anyone picked up on and the organism did enter the eye that way. Treating this organism has proved to be a challenge. This is a very complicated chart, but you can see by these black bars that many antibiotics uh, are not suitable for treating this organism that it is resistant. And uh, so it's really a challenge to treat this organism. Uh, and it's bad also treating pseudomonas aeruginosis. So that together, it's not surprising that this patient went on to lose her eye. But often in these patients, removing the offending piece of, of plastic or silicone, as it was the case here, will help solve the problem. And indeed, the nucleation and the scleral buckle being removed resulted in her returning to her uh, normal state, although unfortunately minus her eye. So any questions about this case? Well, I would like the attendees to post their questions and uh, maybe by the end of the second session, uh, we will uh, open up the, uh, the questions. Would you want to uh, go ahead with your second talk? Sure. Meanwhile, I just have a comment. I felt it's so scary that this organism likes plastic. Yes, it loves plastic tubing, plastic syringes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's even scary for those of us who might think of going to have a manicure or a pedicure because oh, really? it's often contaminating the equipment used to soak one's feet. Mm -hmm. So it, it certainly is a widespread organism. The thing is that most of us are, are healthy and uh, as such, we, we don't end up developing an infection. But for people who have any degree of immunocompromise, mm -hmm. uh, it can certainly be an issue. Yeah, so I guess retinal surgeons should you know, keep this in mind when using scleral buckets. Yes, and also for cataract surgery, which okay. is something done extremely commonly. Well, I will move on then to my second case, which was a conjunctival conundrum. And for both these cases, I want to mention and thank the ophthalmologist, Dr. Matthew Lee Wing, who was involved with these cases. Again, I have nothing to declare. And we will be looking at a conjunctival biopsy that I received. One day I received a call that patient uh, had come into the doctor's office. He had seen multiple ophthalmologists and for a period of several years had had these nodules and they seemed to be getting worse. No matter what had been tried, nothing seemed to improve them. And so finally the patient was seen by Dr. Lee Wing who decided that he needed to do a biopsy. And so here it is. And you can see that we have conjunctiva 
And for some reason, can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, good. I seem to have lost my pointer for some unknown reason. But you can see here that uh, there are, are multiple globules, more than I would usually expect. In the lamina propria, there's an inflammatory infiltrate, and there's no obvious granulomas at this power. And when we look at this more closely, you can see that there's a lot of chronic inflammation, and particularly toward the midsection of the screen, you can see that there are some cells that seem to have vacuolated cytoplasm. Just looking at them, they appear to be macrophages. And I know when I thought, saw them, I thought, well, you know, like we would see in an eye with silicone oil, we often see foamy macrophages. Maybe this is the result of some therapy that the patient was given to get these to resolve, or perhaps something the patient he'd even administered to himself. Here again, you can see them more closely. But I decided, hmm, there also are some macrophages present in an ill-defined kind of way, so as you can see toward the bottom of your screen. And maybe this could be some kind of an infectious process. So I did my stains for fungi, for bacteria, and for mycobacteria. And for this, I included both uh, Zeal Nielsen uh, and a wade fight stain. Wade fight stain is useful for picking up atypical mycobacteria. Uh, and when I found uh, what they showed, I was quite surprised. You can see here that the uh, cells contain some kind of granular PAS positive material. And that was quite unusual. But then the big surprise was on the stains for mycobacteria. And you can see to the right-hand side, we have numerous bacteria that are positive in these clusters of macrophages. And as well, if we look to the left, you see there's a small nerve there. And within the nerve, you can see multiple bacteria. There's not just a few organisms here, there are lots of organisms here. So then I contacted the clinician and I said, how about some more history? Well, this patient had arrived in Canada a few years ago, but was originally from Pakistan. And so this patient was in a place where it would be possible that he could have acquired leprosy. And when you look at the patient's eyes, you can see that there are multiple conjunctival nodules. The conjunctiva is inflamed. You can see he's got uh, a dropping down lower lid. And so it, it would be possible based on this appearance to consider that diagnosis. You can also see from scans that there was no evidence of intraocular uh, infection. And so the next step was, well, what to do? For us, this is a reportable disease. But unfortunately, the day after I made the diagnosis, the patient was moving to another province. And so I had to make sure I had a definite diagnosis to be able to contact our provincial health authorities to then be able to transmit that information to the new province where he was working. The clinician also gave him a letter and gave a family a letter saying that this was possibly going to be a case of leprosy. But uh, in the past, leprosy had a lot of stigma, and that really hasn't disappeared, even though leprosy is treatable now. So I felt it was really important to follow up with this case. So you can see that what I did was to send it off to our National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg. We have the National Laboratory for Canada in our city, and they did PCR on it, found it wasn't TB, and yes, indeed, it was Mycobacterium leprae. And what I thought was fascinating is that uh, a little over 100 years ago, everyone was very excited about the fact that we could do a Zeal Nielsen stain to detect mycobacteria, because that's especially important for detection of tuberculosis, which is still a, a big health threat across the world. And now here we are, uh, we're molecularly looking at base pairs in a bacterium which to me is just amazing how we've progressed in that length of time. So leprosy is a very well-known condition. It's been around for thousands of years. And the problem is that 
the nerves become damaged and as a result, people can't feel pain and then various disabilities result. Uh, it's also known as Hansen's disease. Uh, he was one of the first to describe it. And it's been said to be the first bacterium identified as causing disease in man and the first uh, and most common bacterium to result in ocular damage said that ocular damage occurs in 70 to 75 percent of patients with leprosy. We may think that leprosy is gone and indeed there has been an attempts by the World Health Organization to eradicate it but basically even now there's about 225 to 250,000 people diagnosed every year with this disease. And most commonly, it's found in India, but also second commonly in Brazil. It can also be found in Indonesia and various parts of Africa. So there are pockets of this disease occurring in many different continents. And now with the travel in of people and moving to other places, it's something that we really all need to be aware of. Even in some place like the United States of America, you can see that they have cases. Their cases particularly occur in the south part of the country and are the result of mostly one thing. Or more than two thirds of the cases are related to the nine banded armadillo, which you can see here. Now, it's not that the armadillo comes up and breathes all over somebody, which would be the mechanism of of uh, aerosolizing the organism and inhaling it, it's that people eat armadillos. In the Southern United States, they hunt them and they eat them. And as you can see from the picture in the upper right, the organism has a fairly sturdy carapace. And when they are cutting that off, or when they are washing off the meat, you can end up having aerosolization of the bacteria and that's how they become inhaled. So it's not presumably from the actual eating of the infected meat, it, it's instead from uh, cutting up the carcass that people acquire it. So I would say, if you have a choice, I know which of these two I would go for. Now, leprosy is fascinating in and of itself for just how it's spread throughout the world. Uh, it's been thought that it started somewhere in Africa and from there has spread. And looking at various single nucleotide polymorphisms, you can trace its migration through Asia and up through Europe, and then eventually over to North and to South America. Now, it's a fascinating organism too, just like Stenotrophomonas. It's a fastidious organism with a preference for an intracellular lifestyle, and it particularly likes to be in macrophages. It's hard to study because it can't be grown in vitro. It has been cultured in, in mouse foot pads or in armadillos. And the thing is, it likes to grow at 33 to 35 degrees Celsius, so cooler than our normal body temperature. And that's why armadillos are a favorite because the armadillos have body temperatures in that range. And it's thought that the armadillos originally got the infestation from humans, and now they're just giving it back. Typically, transmission appears to be airborne, and leprosy has a strong incubation period. A very long incubation, incubation period. And, and it's really not the hardiest of organisms. So even though one may catch it in many instances, uh, patients are able to fight off this particular organism. Another thing that's fascinating about it is that it's undergone a reductive evolution. So if you compare it to mycobacterium tuberculosis, it has a way fewer genes. And that's because it has to live intracellularly, and it harnesses the metabolic pathways in the cells that it, it infects. Of course, when we think of leprosy, we think of the ridley jopling system of tuberculoid leprosy going down to lepromatous leprosy with borderline categories in between. Um, but WHO has decided to make this into two separate categories, posicellular and multibacillary leprosy which is a bit easier to classify. And as you can see, many of these lesions are on extremities and places like the ear where there is a cooler temperature. 
So the spectrum of leprosy depends very much on the host and whether or not they have a cell mediated immune response to it or a predominantly antibody related immune response. Where there's a cell mediated immunity, we get granulomas forming and have fewer organisms. Where the antibody response predominates, we end up with the lepromatous type and numerous organisms present. The nerves become damaged, usually not from the organisms themselves actually invading the nerves, but from the re immunologic reaction that occurs in response to the organisms. So you have inflammatory mediators being released, you have T cell mediated uh, cytolysis happening, resulting in ischemia, apoptosis, and ultimately demyelination. And that's why there are so many uh, problems uh, with these patients in so many different sites in the body, including the eye. As you can see, most infections are subclinical and resolve on their own. And there have been various genes that have been implicated in these patients uh, having problems. In particular, they've been talking a lot lately about genes related to Parkinson's disease and that they being uh, present uh, help facilitate this organism's survival. Now, leprosy was described early on as involving the eye, and some of it is through direct uh, lesions as the nodules that we saw in the conjunctiva, but also through uh, neurotropic damage. As you can see in these photos, these patients lose their eyebrows and eyelashes. They end up with ectropion, as in our patient. They can also have entropion and various other findings, particularly in the uh, anterior segment structures. Here are patients who have had corneal problems as a result, not only of conjunctival lesions, but also from uh, losing their uh, ability with their nerves and end up with exposure keratitis. So this is a very serious problem leading to blindness and they estimate that about 5% of people with leprosy are blind. And you can see that a variety of uh, different things have been described uh, as findings with these cases and that the number of organisms present again in the eye is really dependent uh, on um, <clears throat> on how uh, the patient responds with their immune system, just as in other parts of the body. Again, can there be involvement inside the eye? Yes, there can. Uh, it's not nearly as common, and it's generally found in the lepromatous types uh, of involvement, but certainly it can happen. Here's an example of a patient who's had uh, the, one of the most severe types of leprosy, the erythema nodosum leprosum type. And this person's actually developed scleral necrosis, iris prolapse. And in the bottom, in the right-hand side, you can see that there's organisms present in what appears to be the choroid. Now, there also have been studies done looking at eye involvement in armadillos. And uh, you can see that they end up having organisms in all sorts of different places in the eye. So when, if you get a big enough load of bacteria, and these are, are given injections with the organisms, you can see that you can get distributions throughout the eye, not just in anterior areas. So treatment, it's generally the triple treatment that is given these days. There's lots of discussion on who should get what for how long. And this is a matter that I think will uh, continue to be one of debate. But it's important to note that approximately 10% of patients have what are called persister organisms. Uh, and despite treatment, they, they still do carry um, the organism. But certainly these days, leprosy is, is treatable and it's really important that it be detected and not ignored because it can have such serious consequences. And the diagnosis has even moved into the realm of cell phones. They've come up with a, a way of detecting it uh, using a, a program on a cell phone. You take and you do a skin slit smear in some spot like 
an ear and put this material into the little chamber, let your phone analyze it looking for various antigens and they can actually come up with a diagnosis. And that they're hoping that this kind of technology will be helpful in many countries where there is a lack of technology. This is simple, easy to transport and hopefully will result in more diagnoses. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sapnik. That was quite interesting. I was actually amazed by the number of organisms that you managed to have when you did the stain of the, um, the Zeal Nelson, because I saw only one case uh, histopathologically, and um, there were only a few organisms along the nerves, uh, but not that much. Yes, no, this patient had lots, and I was very concerned because uh, he lived with his family and I was worried that there was a possibility to that he would be spreading these organisms to his family. It's hard to catch leprosy, but if you're in close contact with somebody for many years, which was the situation here, that you stand a reasonable chance of, uh, of acquiring the disease. But fortunately, in the end, all of them patients were seen and, uh, and hopefully treated if they had any. All right, thanks again. Um, you can stop sharing the screen so that we can go back to, yeah, thank you, uh, Janice. Uh, back to Martin uh, with his uh, last case for this session. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I should have mentioned that both of these talks were previously presented at our Canadian Ophthalmological Pathology uh, Society meetings. This one was from last year. I called it double trouble because the case uh, involves bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, great. Yes. So I got a case that came with a clinical diagnosis written, this is exact copy of it, uh, bilateral lac large lacrimal glands, query sarcoid. So this was a 69 year old uh, female patient. Um, past negative history was really not contributory, there was no malignancy. Uh, she was seen by ophthalmologists and, and had fullness of superior lateral orbits. So we're, we're talking uh, lacrimal gland territory. Um, normal ocular exam, otherwise. Now, I just took some uh, uh, paper presentations of what this might have looked like. I don't have images for this particular patient. And you can see various degrees of, of bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement. Um, from mild to uh, severe. Um, and I, again, I don't have imaging. The imaging was not performed on this patient at the time, but this is what it might have looked like. Now, this is the biopsy I got from the ophthalmologist. Only, um, uh, sorry, both sides were, um, were biopsied. And you can see here, um, first of all, we have a little bit of residual lacrimal gland visible. There is the orbital tissues, vessels, and fibro adipose tissue. Um, most of the, the, the process, whatever it is, follows the lobular architecture of a lacrimal gland. So we have lobules here, but majority of the normal architecture of the lacrimal gland is replaced uh, with some sort of inflammatory process with only a few scattered ducts and uh, asini still seen. However, if from the other side, there was this very nice uh, uh, lobule in which one half seemed not to be involved and another one seemed to be involved quite heavily. If you do keratin on this uh, slide, you can see that the architecture of lacrimal gland is largely preserved on one half and in the other half, mo majority of the gland is destroyed with only a few residual duct and asinine left. Here's a closer uh, image of what reasonably normal lacrimal gland would look like. And you can see there's a little bit of inflammation in that part, but we have ducts and we have the beautiful asinine. Um, however, the higher power view of the involved portion of the lacrimal glands showed a very intense, heavy uh, um, inflammatory infiltrate that's causing uh, perhaps atrophy, perhaps destruction of the gland um, with some residual um, elements still present. A uh, closer look shows that it's mostly lymphocytic. Uh, there were a few uh, plasma cells present, and a here's one, and a few macrophages present as well. 
but the majority of the infiltrate is, is lymphocytes. There were a variety of vessels present and there was no vasculitis noted. Uh, here is a CD20 stain highlighting the B cell component of this uh, lymphocytic infiltrate. And here's CD3 showing that majority of cells are uh, CD3 lymphocytes. And this pattern of 20 and 3 is very characteristic for a reactive uh, infiltrate. It does not raise uh, worries for, for lymphoma in this case, which would also not preserve the lobular architecture. So that was not on high on our differential diagnosis. Um, here are um, plasma cells which are present. Um, one of the main causes of uh, orbital inflammation, as we well know, is IgG4 disease um, related disease. So we've had the uh, IgG stain, which shows that, again, just like CD138, plasma cells are present. But when you look for IgG4 ones, they're largely absent. So at this stage in a workup, uh, what we can say is that we have chronic lymphocytic dacryoadenitis. Um, it's negative for sarcoidosis, which was the suspicion clinically. It's negative for IgG4 positive plasma cells, so it's not IgG4 related disease, and it's negative for malignancy. But what is it? So what's the cause? Bilateral lacrimal uh, gland enlargement has been described many times in literature, and this is the oldest paper I could find. There's probably older ones uh, present. So in the report in 1938 on a 19-year-old female, um, Dr. Morgan already uh, described that there was a uh, swelling of both of her lacrimal glands. And in this case, he diagnosed Mikulich syndrome. Um, my mentor and her um, longtime research partner, Jack Rookman and Valerie White have published this paper on the role of biopsy lacrimal, lacrimal gland inflammation. And I found this very useful and eye-opening, pun intended, um, paper. Um, when it comes to diagnosing the role of pathologists in diagnosing lacrimal gland inflammation. And this is the key table from that paper and a takeaway. They, they had 60 patients and they divided them into unilateral and bilateral as well as by their diagnosis. And you can see that they had 18 cases of bilateral um, lacrimal gland inflammation and the varieties of, uh, of uh, causes here, Sjogren, sarcoidal, we'll go through those in a second. But what I would like, to, would like to highlight is that when the diagnosis could not be made and it was non-specific lacrimal inflammation, it was in the cases that were unilateral. Um, unilateral cases, of course, can have diagnosable causes. Um, but what this shows is that when you have bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement, we should try to go um, to perhaps a little further and do not stop at nonspecific lacrimal inflammation because usually, based on this study anyway, there should be an identifiable cause. And if we look carefully, we might be able to identify it. So what's the differential diagnosis? Well, if you think of a broad picture here, uh, this could be orbital inflammation that secondarily includes lacrimal glands just because they're placed there, or it could be restricted dacryodenitis as we have seen in, in our case. And if that's the case, the causes could be, of course, uh, divided into infectious, autoimmune, drug-induced, neo and neoplastic. So let's start with infections. And this is just a walk through the literature that you can find if you spend the time on what can cause a bilateral enlargement of lacrimal glands. So here's one uh, article in Spanish, but you can see the Epstein-Barr uh, is spelled the same way. So Epstein-Barr virus um, infection can cause this. And um, so uh, it's, a, it's a representation of uh, infectious mononucleosis. Um, the tonsillitis is a typical presentation, of course, but you can have that cryodenitis and it can be bilateral as in this case. Um, we've just heard how tuberculosis and syphilis for that matter can present um, in um, ocular structures, including lacrimal glands, and they can cause bilateral disease. Herpes herpes simplex virus can do this. Um, and other infectious would include Staph aureus, Staph biogenes, chlamydia, syphilis, and brucellosis that have been described. How about autoimmune conditions? It's probably the most common cause that, and one that we would think of most readily. So of course, when we think of in, enlarged and inflamed, especially lymphocytic inflammation and lacrimal glands, we think of Sjogren's syndrome. 
and lymphocytic um, presentation of Sjogren's syndrome as, as limited to just the lacrimal gland, especially bilateral, has even been proposed as a subtype of Sjogren's syndrome in the past. And you can see that the um, histology would agree quite well with what we're seeing. Um, other causes, um, Wegner's, what used to be called Wegner's disease, um, graminomatosis with polyangitis is the current name, uh, can, cause, can cause bilateral dacryoadenitis. The presentation morphologically would be different. There would be vasculitis and there would be uh, necrosis and there would be eosinophilia, um, which we didn't have in our case. Uh, reactive arthritis has been uh, linked to bilateral dacryoadenitis in one paper. And even other autoimmune uh, diseases such as lymphocytic hypophysitis, so inflammation of uh, the pituitary gland have been linked to dacryoadenitis. So I think any um, in autoimmune condition can probably give that kind of presentation. Um, other um, systemic sarcoidosis, which was the uh, clinical diagnosis in this case or suspicion can obviously cause it. Now that's presenting with um, granulomas, non-necrotizing um, uh, with uh, not so much inflammation, um, which is different morphologically, but clinically would be presenting similarly. Um, and in fact, in uh, this paper examining lacrimal gland involvement in sarcoidosis, um, isolated uh, gland involvement was present in eight out of 27 cases. Bilateral one was the remaining. So it's more common. Um, IgG4 related systemic disease, we already mentioned, uh, and that can present as a bilateral enlargement of lacrimal glands. Um, here's a one published report with a presentation. Um, another um, article from uh, Calgary, actually, where I am, uh, presented, showed the presentation of Rosai Dorfman disease uh, with bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement. And that will present with lymphohistiocytic um, uh, presentation uh, mi microscopically with uh, large pale histiocytes and empyrophalesis. Kimura's disease has been described to present this way. Here's an image of that. Eosinophilia would be very characteristic finding here, which we did not have. Xanthogranuloma's disease can affect orbits and, um, and lacrimal glands. And there were several cases uh, described where the presentation have been bilateral. Finally, we don't think of this very often, and this is mostly in children, but um, several drugs, including valproic acid and isotretinone, uh, can cause um, bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement, but the um, mechanism here is hypertrophy, not so much as inflammation. And of course, neoplasms. Now, the neoplasms that would involve both lacrimal glands um, will be confined typically to the lymphoproliferative diseases, uh, so lymphoma, here is a, a, a PTLD, so post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder involving both lacrimal glands, and here is a bilateral lacrimal gland lymphoma arising in a patient with Sjogren's. However, back to our case, if we look back at her clinical presentation, um, her regular blood work showed eosinophilia. Her past medical history included severe asthma since childhood, vasculitic crush and migratory arthritis in her 50s and hyper eosinophilia. Skin biopsy from a different site confirmed eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, also known as Churg Strauss disease. And this, she was treated with high dose steroids with taper and the, her symptoms have resolved. She does occasionally get vasculitic flares and she's then treated um, as necessary. So has Churk-Strauss syndrome um, been uh, previously published um, as presenting with symmetrical dacryoadenitis? Um, and it has. And here is that uh, article from 2012 by a Japanese group um, presenting in a presentation consistent with Mikulic disease, but in this case, it was Churk-Strauss syndrome. That's the only article in previous case I could find. And in that paper, they present, showed the presentation of the, of the patient including bilateral um, lacrimal gland enlargement here. She also had mild swelling in both submandibular glands, kind of consistent with Mikulic uh, type presentation. And the images from their articles are very similar to what we've seen. 
So in conclusion, bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement has a wide differential spanning infectious, inflammatory, autoimmune, drug-induced, and neoplastic causes. And establishing the diagnosis almost always requires clinical correlation and looking into a patient's history carefully. Um, Church-Strauss um, syndrome or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyandritis may present this way and it may mimic uh, Sjogren's syndrome. And that's my talk. Thank you so much for your attention. i uh, be happy to answer any questions. Interesting case, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, do you see any questions posted uh, in your chat? For me, no questions so far. But uh, I do have uh, like something in mind when it comes to lacrimal gland lesions. Do you come across Castleman's disease that's involving the lacrimal gland? And, uh, What's your experience, or Dr. Heathcote, maybe, and Janice can comment on this? Because I'm not really fond of uh, lymphoproliferative disorders and this category of, <laughs> of pathologies, really. So, any comments? I have uh, not encountered a case yet. There were a few cases where there was a heavily um, inflammation in the eye with germinal center formations, and those germinal center formations did show those characteristic uh, vessels slightly. Um, and I actually did think of it and I took it to my hematopathology colleagues. Would you think that there was um, sufficient uh, findings here? And, and they thought no. And so there is a spectrum of these um, findings with these germinal centers that show a certain degree of um, regression and fibrosis. And uh, uh, I have not had a case yet. Mm -hmm. Rahit, could you have any comment or Janice? No, I'm afraid I don't uh, have anything to add. I don't either. Okay. It's an area that we do not like. Also, vitreous <laughs> biopsies are nightmares to us uh, as well. Um, I don't see any questions as well, uh, again. Um, so, I don't know. I can see that Dr. Uh, Azza Maktabi is with us. So, Azza, do you have any comments uh, to the speakers? You can unmute yourself if you do. Because I do remember that she showed me a case of um, bilateral lacrimal gland enlargement, lots of lymphocytes as well, and it was really puzzling. And um, I don't know, maybe we should go back to the history of the patient and check for autoimmune stuff as well. Okay. Uh, I guess we can conclude our session. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for attention and uh, staying up this Yes, way. thank you. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to be involved. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I don't know if Azza would like to add anything just gives me here the talking permitted and uh, no. Yeah, now I'm mute and I'm mute. Okay, good, good, yeah. all right, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, hi everyone, It's uh, it was a very interesting uh, meeting. I enjoy it, uh, though I joined late, uh, I didn't catch up early. Um, yeah, I, I remember that case, it was a very, very puzzling and still we don't have a final diagnosis, though we thought of Kasselman disease. It's a tough diagnosis, so we're still working on that. Okay, but I do you remember that there were germinal, I mean, like follicles with germinal centers, or was it just diffuse? I can't remember exactly about that. No, no, there were there were germinal centers, which is somehow atrophic. But and we have some like the onion ring uh, arrangement. Okay. Yeah. But, and yeah, we but, might consider sending some photos. Yeah, and the patient actually has uh, bronchial asthma as well. Uh -huh. okay. So we we thought one of our differential was the Churk Strauss syndrome as well. All right, good. Thank okay, you. any other questions or comments from the attendees? Nothing so far. Well, thank you very much. It has been really a pleasure uh, seeing you and having you. Thank you for your time and hope to see you in the coming COPS meeting. I hope 
we will be able to to come over to uh, Canada. And uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.